There we are, that's great. Sorry about that uh, five minute delay. We're just uh, waiting for Professor Leven, who is not yet here, but will be, I'm sure, very soon. So that's why there was a short delay, but we're going to crack on and uh, hope that he comes in the next few minutes. So my name's Owen Bennett Jones. Thank you very much for coming tonight. And we're just going to talk. Uh, through what's happening in Pakistan at the moment. There's a lot, as ever, uh, going on in <laughs> Pakistan. So what we'll do is we'll talk for about 40 minutes here on the panel and then throw it open for 45, 50 minutes to, to you to ask questions. Uh, as I say, there is a lot going on just now. I mean, the United States has always been uh, confused about how to handle <coughs> Pakistan, and that is very much on display at the moment. There, there were two um, announcements coming from the administration over the last week or two. One was President Obama announcing next year's aid program for Pakistan, which is 2.4 billion. And virtually the same day, Hillary Clinton announced uh, the possible sanctions on, uh, on, on <coughs> Pakistan for uh, its uh, anticipated decision to have a gas pipeline with Iran. So on the one hand, uh, giving money to Pakistan, on the other hand, imposing sanctions. There, there are, I mean, there are a couple of big stories running at the moment. One, one is Memogate, which I'm sure many of you will have heard about. I'll do a very brief summary of it, and Fazan is going to talk, talk more about it uh, in a moment. But basically, this, this, this arose when uh, the U.S. military at a very senior level, Admiral Mike Mullen, received a secret unsigned message uh, saying that the civilian government in Pakistan wanted help uh, reigning in the military. This was after the Abbottabad raid on bin Laden's compound. And this message said this is a good opportunity because either the military have failed to find him or been complicit in hiding him, so this is a good time to help us Democrats, elected politicians, to uh, rein in the military. And, and add, adding in, for good measure, we think there's going to be a coup. So we very much need your help with this. The Americans pretty much ignored it, which frustrated the messenger, who's this very exotic uh, businessman, <laughs> uh, Mansour Ijaz, who was then filmed. Anyway, I won't go into all that. But <laughs> <laughs> Mansour Ijaz was obviously frustrated and wrote an op-ed in the FT saying that he'd basically delivered this message on behalf of a senior official unnamed, which of course got the Pakistan media incredibly excited, who was the official, and then it all focused went on to Hussein Akhani, who's the, uh, amb or was the yes. ambassador in the United States, who then had to resign, which wasn't enough, apparently, to satisfy the army, and it rumbles on, but you can go into that. So that's, that's, that's been a big issue, this Memogate scandal. And then uh, running alongside it, there's this uh, question of... of President Zadari's corruption and uh, this you know, very advanced case in Switzerland where he was, and his wife, uh, Benazir Bhutto, were convicted of, of corruption, uh, of taking kickbacks from Swiss <coughs> companies. Uh, and the, they got out of it on a tech, they, the whole strategy being to delay this case, which went on for years and years. But this conviction came uh, and then was overturned, it was set aside, in fact, rather than overturned. I mean, Zadari insists it was overturned, but it wasn't. It was set aside whilst uh, they exercised their right to have a jury trial, thereby delaying the whole thing even further. When he became president, President Asif Zadari, uh, the Swiss, of course, in time honored fashion, dropped it uh, for fear of upsetting the president of a foreign power. So, and, and, and now the Supreme Court is trying to revive that case. So, that, so that's another issue which has led to the Prime Minister being held in contempt of court. I mean, it all sounds incredibly complicated, and it always is. But at the end of the day, you've got a very active Supreme Court. You've got the army pushing on memo gate, accusing the civilian officials of treason. And you've got this clash between the three basic big powers in, in the country, the civilian government, the army, and this new emerging power, the su Supreme Court. So that's, that's a little, uh, very sort of, uh, sort of one-minute summary of what's going on in Pakistan at the moment. And to, so to discuss, discuss it, we've got Omar Waraich. Now, I'm sure many of you will have read his uh, excellent articles in, in The Independent and in Time. So he's been there how many years now? Five. Five years, churning out very sort of uh, close-focused stuff on what's going on in Pakistan, I mean, all the normal stories, the floods and all the sort of you know, war on terror and all that stuff, but I mean, also a lot of very, very sort of uh, good material on what's happening in, in Pakistan politics internally, the detailed stuff, what's happening in Pakistan politics. Uh, we've also got Ali Dayan, who is made, an, you know, from Human Rights Watch, and I have to say, is 
taken up the mantle of you know, making incredibly gutsy statements on the most difficult issues. So you, know, you get to issues like blasphemy, which no one else will touch, and has led to people being killed for saying things in public about this. And uh, Ali Dayan has got a track record now of having made you know, a number of interventions on these extremely sensitive subjects, and as a result has uh, had a fair amount of trouble, I think it's uh, fair to say, from, from, uh, from the authorities. Uh, and we've got Fazana Sheikh, who's uh, been here before many times and has uh, got her book, Making Sense of Pakistan, which basically said that the confusion over Pakistan's purpose, you know, ever since 1947, has never been resolved. And uh, that lies at the heart of, uh, you know, the, the lack of an understanding of what the country's ideological purpose is lies at the heart of uh, many of the d dilemmas it, it faces today. And we'll, I'll introduce Professor Levin, if and when if and when he comes. So, uh, so, so thank you for the three who have come. And uh, Omar, I was going to start with you. If you could just tell us a bit about the Supreme Court, because that's a new thing. I mean, it's, I mean, it's a few years now, but it's, it, it's been building up for a few years, and it is now playing an extremely active role in Pakistani <coughs> politics, which, is, which hasn't been the case hitherto. So when did it start? Just take us through the Supreme Court becoming such a big, big player. The Supreme Court uh, pretty much became the focus of events in Pakistan in 2007. This is when then dictator General Musharraf suspended uh, the Chief Justice. There was a lawyers led uh, movement to restore him, which succeeded once first in July, only for him to be sacked again when Musharraf imposed state of emergency in November 2007. The reason why uh, General Musharraf was so perturbed or by the Chief Justice in particular, Iftikhar Chaudhry, was his enthusiasm for what's called judicial activism. So motor notices, taking notices of issues that, this, that troubled officialdom in Pakistan, whether it was missing persons at the time or the Steel Mills case, which upset the Prime Minister. Uh, missing persons. Uh, I, 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 I'm going to ask, I'm gonna ask him to sort of slow down. Okay. To, so, <laughs> missing persons. Well... Ali can tell you the full script on missing persons, but principally, I mean, in, in short, you're talking about people who were picked up by the Pakistan intelligence agencies and haven't been heard from again. Uh, these are mostly uh, Baloch activists who are fighting either for their own rights or to an extent separation and suspected uh, jihadists. Uh, so without due process, these people have been picked up and disappeared. The families haven't heard from them. Uh, there haven't been any cases, and this is something that's going on still. And the Supreme Court has been... And the Supreme Court has brought this up again. So after the Chief Justice was reinstated in, for the second time in March 2009, after a successful lawyers-led movement, which was backed principally uh, by former Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif, he assumed not only great popularity, but a rare, it was also a rare source of moral authority in Pakistan. And so as we're seeing now, uh, the Supreme Court in some ways has become a central arbiter of sorts for many people. So when it comes to memo gates, uh, the way people thought to resolve that was that Nawaz Sharif decided to go to the Supreme Court and take that issue there. Uh, when it has come to missing persons, it has been the Supreme Court that has taken up the issue, not Parliament, I mean, more, most prominently the Supreme Court summoning intelligence heads and chiefs for the very first time and using you know, very strong language and making demands of uh, the intelligence agencies that have scarcely been made before. Um, at the same time, however, uh, the Supreme Court has lost much of its popularity because it's seen to be a partisan actor in the sense that it has troubled the sitting government more than it has the opposition or the military by contrast. Uh, and it's also developed a certain flavor for taking up uh, populist causes which may not have much significance or perhaps have, you know, uh, extend beyond the remit or the traditional remit of the Supreme Court. So, for example, we've just had the issue the other day where a provincial parliamentarian was caught on camera slapping an election official. Uh, now, <coughs> because of this, the Chief Justice takes this up and he goes as far as to say this is actually worse than a previous incident where paramilitary troops killed a young youth. Um, at the same time, uh, so uh, then you have other bizarre cases like him pursuing a case against the actress Atika Odo for allegedly possessing two bottles of wine. Um, 
uh, you know, it's a sort of, he, he's been demonstrating this enthusiasm for Suomoto cases. What's perhaps most troubling for people who are in favor of constitutional process and an independent judiciary has been his approach to the government, the cases against Asif Zadari in particular, where it's not so much seen as him pursuing corruption cases as such, but effectively being behind a, an effort to overthrow the government with what is alleged to be the tacit backing of both the army and the opposition. Thank you very much. We'll talk more about the Supreme Court, because it is now becoming a, a major player in uh, Pakistan politics. It's active, as you say, on so many issues, often on its own initiative. Uh, let's try and work through Memogate as well, which is part of the Supreme Court activism. And Fazana's going to help us uh, work out, if you just explain exactly what's happened and why it's important. Well, as, as, as you said, um, Owen, uh, Memogate uh, basically centers on uh, a secret memo uh, that was allegedly prepared by, the, um, uh, by, by close associates of, of, uh, of President Sartari. Um, it was a memo that uh, arrived, as Owen has already indicated, um, uh, uh, on the desk of, of um, uh, General Mullen, uh, in which uh, basically uh, it was suggested uh, that uh, Pakistan, following the capture and killing of Osama bin Laden, uh, was at risk of a military coup, uh, and that uh, therefore uh, there, were, there, there was concern within sections of Pakistan's government um, who uh, were making it known uh, to the Americans um, that uh, they sought American assistance um, and that in exchange for such assistance to stave off um, a coup, uh, they would be prepared to uh, reorganize uh, the intelligence services. Uh, so this uh, was, was sort of the nub of the issue. Now, the reason why um, it, it, it has blown up to, to, to become uh, this, this, this big issue that now goes by the name of Memogate is because, of course, uh, it, it uh, um, uh, potentially uh, carries uh, charges of high treason uh, against uh, the president, uh, who is, as I said, alleged to have orchestrated this memo through Pakistan's ambassador to the United States, Hussein Haqqani. Um, and uh, obviously, uh, the, the, the person who um, as Owen has already indicated, spilt the beans, is this very exotic businessman <laughs> uh, by the name of um, Mansoor Ejaz, um, who I think it is fair to say uh, appears to be working uh, for a number of different agencies. Uh, he claims, of course, uh, to have won the confidence of uh, Pakistan's intelligence services, particularly its head, uh, General Pasha. Uh, but he also uh, claims to have the confidence of um, key uh, figures in the American uh, defense and, and political establishment, um, to say nothing of uh, having apparent links with other intelligence agencies. His role remains very shady, but uh, the, 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 the fact of the matter is that obviously it is very much on the basis of his evidence that the case will, uh, will, will rest or uh, crumble. As, uh, as it may well do, uh, because it is, after all, uh, on the basis of claims made by Ajaz in a series of, of articles, particularly the one mentioned by um, Owen uh, in the FT, in which um, it was alleged, as I said, that the government of Pakistan had sought 
the assistance uh, of, uh, of the Americans uh, to, to, to stave off uh, a military coup. Um, this is now, of course, uh, being heard uh, by a judicial commission. Uh, Mr. Mansour Jals could not, uh, uh, he claims, testify uh, in Pakistan because no one was prepared to uh, guarantee his security. And so uh, he was given special dispensation to testify at the High Commission uh, in London. Meanwhile, uh, Ambassador Hussein Haqqani, who was, uh, who was forced to tender his resignation uh, on this issue and was effectively held under house arrest in Pakistan, um, was released some weeks ago and allowed to go free um, and is now, I understand, back in the United States. But of course, um, uh, you know, under, under, uh, 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 on the understanding that uh, he will return to Pakistan uh, if, if, his, uh, if, he, if, you know, called to do so by the Supreme Court to give evidence. So the case continues. Um, but it is, of course, um, important um, if only because it again highlights uh, the, 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 the simmering tension and, 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 and the power struggle uh, between uh, an elected government and, uh, and, uh, and Pakistan's powerful uh, military uh, establishment, a, a power struggle that has uh, characterized Pakistan since its inception and uh, continues to do so to this day. Thank you very much. So that's the army and the uh, civilian government <coughs> battling it out through this memo gate issue, and we've heard about the Supreme Court, you know, the new entrant really into Pakistan politics, making its contribution as well. I w want, uh, Ali Dayan, if you can, just to talk us through um, the other big issue that's running at the moment, which is these contempt cases. And uh, the, the Prime Minister has now been held in contempt of court uh, by the Supreme Court, which all dates back to this corruption case. And we didn't get into the legalities of the corruption case, but can you just talk us through that whole story of why that matters and what the Supreme Court is trying to do to the government and why? Um, what we're seeing actually in Pakistan is, uh, since 2008, is the emergence of uh, new power centers. The judiciary is very clearly one. Uh, the media is another. Um, now, at one level, you can see this all as every time a new power center emerges, the party that is actually losing power is the military, because it has hitherto controlled these uh, institutions uh, for its benefit. Uh, so in that sense, if you're looking at this where I'm looking at it from, it's a positive uh, development. Having said that, these are all institutions that are discovering um, the scope of their independence and uh, the limits of their power, uh, if you will. Um, and what we've seen, and this actually carries on from what Farzana was saying about uh, Memogate, is that the Supreme Court, uh, which has an antagonistic relationship with the government, born of Zardari's refusal initially to restore the Chief Justice to office, has persistently taken a confrontational uh, position with the government. Um, it has also engaged in what, uh, certainly from, from a legal perspective, uh, certainly at Human Rights Watch, we see as multiple incidents of uh, incursion of judicial overreach, of incursion into the due domain of the legislature and the executive. Uh, this has, um, uh, and what this has done is that it has created a culture of confrontation between the judiciary and uh, 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 the government, uh, and the executive rather. Now, uh, with Memogate, you had a particular moment where what certainly critics of the judiciary had argued all along, which was that the judiciary was a partisan actor acting at the behest of the military uh, to essentially uh, limit civilian power, uh, gained widespread currency. Uh, this was perhaps not the military's intention uh, in, in uh, instigating Memogate, but that's what happened. Now, concurrent to all of this is the long-running issue of Zardari's, uh, of, of these corruption cases against him. In, in, in Switzerland. Um, the court, in, it, in the first instance, uh, basically overruled this thing called the National Reconciliation Ordinance, uh, which was an impunity law, essentially, and, and deserved certainly to be overruled. And there was very little debate about, about that. Um, now, in, but 
in the interim, Zardari was elected president, and the government argues that he enjoys executive immunity as president <coughs> of Pakistan, and that no proceedings can actually take place against him for the duration that he holds office. What the Supreme Court is asking the government to do is to actually um, move a foreign jurisdiction uh, to institute criminal proceedings against the serving head of state. Uh, this is a fairly unusual request for anyone to make. Um, and, and, and it does, uh, uh, certainly as far as the government is concerned and the ruling PPP is concerned, smack of political bias. Now, the Prime Minister has not written this letter to the Swiss authorities asking for these cases to be opened. There is, by the way, there has been such a long period, time period that has elapsed that there are very serious questions about whether any such prosecution would even take place, even if, if the government of Pakistan did uh, write that letter. But actually, what this is, is a political dispute, because the government says that we have implemented your judgment, this part of it is unimplementable, and you're asking us to criminalize the head of state in a foreign jurisdiction, we can't do that. The Supreme Court says, follow our orders or else, because the majesty of the rule of law prevails. And what you have is an impasse. You have a situation where the assumption is, if you're looking at this from a rights or a, or a civilian rule, the strengthening of civil, civilian rule framework, what Pakistan needs, really, is, is a, a, a cementing of the democratic process. And for governments to serve out their terms and to lose power through an election, and for a replacement government to be elected. And the problem with this confrontation between the Supreme Court and the government is, essentially, that, um, that, that there is the, the danger inherent in all of this that the Supreme Court will actually bring the whole system tumbling down. And that is actually what, what people's hesitation stems from. So, I mean, there, there is another layer of complication. So, 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 so you, I mean, basically, you've got this conflict between the, the court and the government. And on the other hand, you've got this conversation between the army and the government, which is expressed partly through Memogate and partly through the army, you know, chipping away at, at, at the idea that this government is cause it's so corrupt that it should be allowed to uh, remain in office for its complete term and whether there should be a caretaker government uh, to set up a, the next elections. So let, let me introduce Professor Anton Levens arrived uh, from King's College London, uh, wrote this book, A Hard Country, which recently uh, came out. And uh, talked a lot about uh, the sort of social relations at quite a low level within Pakistan and also said things about the army which have been quite controversial. So I'm going to ask you to talk us through your understanding of the civil military relationship now and where, where that stands because it is quite fluid at the moment and, and so, so where, where's that going now? First of all, sorry, my apologies. I had to give a talk on Russia. Russia is another. <laughs> I used to be a journalist myself and the various subject the countries I covered pursue me like tin cans tied to a dog's tail. Um, I'm tempted to set an exam question. Democracy in Russia and in Pakistan, compare and contrast. <laughs> um, anyway, fluid, yes, I mean, the simple answer is, uh, if, um, if I knew as of now the exact state of the relationship, well, I don't know, I'd probably be head of the ISI, wouldn't I? I mean, <laughs> I often say, you know, the, the beginning of wisdom on the subject of Pakistan is to admit how little you know a lot of the time. Uh, the other thing is, I, I was thinking about Memogate, this Memogate in particular, uh, the thought has occurred to me many times, uh, you know, I'm sure many of us in the, this room have torn our hair uh, over the prevalence of conspiracy theories in Pakistan. But one of the reasons why there are so many conspiracy theories is that there are so many conspiracies. Um, and conspiracy theories which, you know, look at the death of General Zia, so many other things. You know, all we know is there was a conspiracy. But, you know, who did it and why? That we don't know. Anyway, just an introduction. Uh, things about the military relationship today. I think first it's worth pointing out because, you, you know, that there's this sort of constant buzz of background radiation in Pakistan observes about of Pakistan. Is there going to be a military coup? No. I mean, in the sense of a, a coup to actually seize power, like the coup of 99 or 77, or, uh, the military at present, the last thing it wants is to take responsibility for the government. Uh, it has enough on its plate, you know, with the, <coughs> what is in effect a civil war, uh, with the insurgency that it's fighting. Uh, it really doesn't want responsibility for electricity shortages, inflation, unemployment, all these things. Far better to have a civilian buffer 
that can absorb all the unpopularity from this. Uh, and indeed, I mean, if you look at the history of Pakistan, um, there is you know, an average of a decade or so between military coups, uh, in part, of course, because the military, uh, at the end of every period in government, and admittedly the periods in government have been very different, there is a realization among the sol uh, serving soldiers that the military has lost, the military as an institution has lost in popularity as a result, that its image as the neutral, patriotic, <coughs> heroic defenders of the country has been damaged by its time in government. Uh, partly because of uh, specific things that military governments have done, but also because, as so many people, including long service serving ministers, have said to me over the years, um, nobody can love a Pakistani government, uh, whether civilian or military, um, because uh, it, you know, it doesn't respond to the needs of the people. <coughs> Uh, it can't very often, it doesn't have the resources to do so. Uh, its lower level agents are, well, actually many of its higher level agents are corrupt, its police are brutal. Every government becomes unpopular, whether military or civilian. Uh, and so uh, there is then a move actually on the part of the military itself to go back to barracks to try to re-establish its image in the public mind, its popularity and so forth. Above all at present, no desire for a coup in the sense of actually a military coup to create a military regime. That said, of course, the military never does quite go back to barracks. Uh, it remains always um, a powerful political force. Uh, it, because you know, it, it, it is, um, with all its dreadful faults still, you know, a, a comparatively efficient institution in a country of very <laughs> inefficient institutions. And of course, you can answer my points later if you sure. wish. Uh, it is also, I was about to say, extremely rich, comparatively speaking. It has, uh, I mean, the fundamental problem of, Pac of the Pakistani state is that it can't re raise revenues in the first place. It has the lowest levels of revenue collection in South Asia. But of those revenues it does raise, of course, as we all know, a very disproportionately large bit goes to the armed forces, which allows them, within their own sphere, to act with comparative efficiency and success, which then bolsters their image in the country as a whole, which they lose when they become responsible for the government as a whole. They get into the same messes, they have the same failures as civilian governments. Now, at the same time, the military uh, at heart, of course, despises all politicians. Uh, and also, uh, under civilian governments, um, believes that there are certain red lines that must not be crossed in terms of the independence and power of the military. And of course, there is the ultimate red line, which is if they see the country as in danger of disintegration, then they will act. That's true, by the way, of many militaries around the world. Uh, possibly the Pakistan army is more willing than most to, th to see the country as on the brink of disintegration, but anyway. Uh, what are those red lines? Uh, the red lines come down above all to, uh, as they see it, in, uh, interference in the strategic, the, the vital interests of the country, the vital interests, the vital strategic and security interests of the country as defined by the military, by the generals themselves. The second thing is uh, attempts at political control of the, the military. Um, and there are legitimate and illegitimate aspects to this. The illegitimate aspect is, of course, their determination to remain independent, in control of security policy, uh, to, for example, uh, maintain complete control and complete lack of transparency when it comes to the military intelligence services, MI and the ISI. Uh, there is a slightly, one could say, more legitimate fear, or one that one could have some sympathy with, which is there is deep fear in the military of civilian governments interfering in the military promotion process. Uh, because there, what they see is the possibility of generals being appointed for political reasons by different political governments, and they see that as pointing towards the factionalization of the military along political lines, and ultimately the, the fear of a split, civil war, or whatever. In present circumstances, as far as I can see, I mean, in recent years, we've, we've seen this 
come out. You know, the, the military reacted very badly and successfully uh, against the government's attempt uh, to transfer control of the ISI uh, to, and that was stopped dead. Um, memo gate, we don't know what happened, frankly, or what was responsible for that, so I won't speculate. Uh, but certainly, um, the military has pushed back again and again over attempts to increase uh, civilian uh, control over it in, in recent years. Uh, the military, of course, uh, uh, retains the ultimate veto over relations with India, um, what, what governments do. And we've seen the military push back. I mean, not, you know, I mean, they haven't, they haven't blocked attempts at improvement with India, but they've certainly qualified them and insisted that they have the ultimate veto over them. Uh, and at present, um, they are, well, quite, I mean, I, I cannot say for sure. There's been a great deal of speculation about what their role will be in the political process and the next elections. What one can say for sure is that what the military dreads, for obvious reasons, is a party with an absolute majority in Parliament, the 1997 Nawaz Sharif phenomenon, because they think at that point, that as indeed was true of Nawaz Sharif, that he might feel that he had the authority actually to begin to gain greater control over them. Um, what they like is a divided political scene, um, you know, with a balance of political parties, a coalition in which they then can act as the brokers and so forth and so on. Uh, that is, by the way, most likely what they will get, or what will happen in the next elections anyway. How far they are acting to build up Imran Khan, uh, the Tariq Insar, we'll that. that's coming later. We'll, we'll talk about that later. Yeah. I'm sure, I'm sure is, we'll get a question on, on Imran Khan. Is, is not certain to me, though it is plausible in some respects. Let me stop you there. Thank you very much for that introduction from you as well. And uh, I'm just going to, before we throw it open, just... Uh, Get some uh, expansion of that derisive uh, <laughs> sound on, on, on the question of. I mean, it seemed to me the point that you were objecting to was uh, you know, the, ar the army is one of the most efficient functioning yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, organizations in a very dysfunctional administrative system. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's a bloated, <laughs> unaccountable, corrupt behemoth that is holding that country hostage. I mean, that's the fact of the matter, and I know that Professor Levin tends to have a rose-tinted view of the Pakistani military. Um, that's fair enough. Uh, Don't so discuss my rose-tinted view of the military, and I won't discuss your view of the political parties, my friend. Uh, <laughs> my view of the political parties is, is on the record, uh, which is that, um, I mean, the, the problem with the Pakistani military is, look, look, looking at this from a human rights perspective, I can tell you that the Pakistani military is the principal human rights abuser in Pakistan. Um, it, is, uh, it has affected large-scale disappearances. Torture uh, is endemic in that country. And the military is the engine of this abuse. Um, it is when we talk about corruption or an unaccountable state, um, accountability is an in indivisible kind of exercise. Either you have it across the board or you don't. When you have the most powerful actor in the country resisting any attempts at accountability or transparency, what you do is that you create a fundamentally opaque system where civilian politicians also uh, then take advantage of that, uh, that particular situation. It is very important to understand that there is a patronage state in Pakistan, and that state has been put in place by the military. It is controlled by the military. It's, of course, what they are very adept at is changing the rules of the game. So it is OK for them to dispense patronage. But if a civilian does it, oh, well, they are corrupt. Now, the point is that everybody is corrupt, actually. OK, let me, let me get Omar in on this and put, put to you the contrary point, which mm. is, I mean, it's, it's fine to say the army have all these uh, massive shortcomings. But the democratically elected governments are, are you know, dysfunctional, corrupt, and incompetent. Uh, so there isn't so much to choose between them. And what would you say to that argument? Well, there's a famous quotation of Benazir Bhutto's where she said, you know, we may have been in government, but we never had power. And I think that that's a crucial distinction that many observers of Pakistan need to make, which is that when civilian governments are elected, 
they have severely, severely attenuated powers. Now, we've talked about Professor uh, Lever mentioned India in terms of veto. There has been a veto. I mean, there have been vetoes on a number of occasions. For example, this most favored nation status, which Pakistan needs. It needs to be able to trade with India. It doesn't have, uh, it needs to be able to grow its economy. It needs to be able to, if it's going to <coughs> talk about its geostrategic value, that is one way to do it. You mentioned the sanctions as well. It has been the will of the Pakistani government, for example, and it, it's almost a consensus within civilians, uh, among civilians, whether it's on India or whether it's on Iran, that Pakistan has desperate energy needs. And therefore, uh, you know, a, a gas pipeline w with India is something that is in his Pakistan's long-term interest, not just interest, it's a desperate, desperate need. That, again, has been vetoed uh, by the military. Uh, w with some approval from the U.S. Now, when it comes to the question of efficiency, I mean, really, if you, if you look at uh, when one talks about the idea that Pakistan is breaking down, the military has been the engine of that in some ways. If you talk about a Pakistani federation, the reason why this federation is fraying is often the military's actions. But again, so you're talking about the military. I asked you about the democratic yeah. governments. I mean, wh when you look at the record of this last government, yeah. which was elected in elections which were generally accepted as, as correct and fair. I mean, this was a genuinely elected government. How, to what extent has it acted as a democratic government? Well, I mean, wh one thing, I mean, there are a number it's of things you business, see, for example. Well, people say this, you know, I mean, for example, it, things are, it, and that's actually, you know, the way many people can see it on a superficial level, but the reality is more complicated than that. I mean, for example, let me ask you, well, who will be the next Indian Prime Minister? Well, his name is Rahul Gandhi. Why? Because he is the son of assassinated oh. former Prime Minister Indira Gandhi, who uh, is the daughter, uh, sorry, he was the son of uh, assass former assassinated Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi, who was the son of assassinated former Prime Minister Indira Gandhi, who was the daughter of Nehru. And when you have assassinations, when you have interruptions more often in the Pakistani context of the political process, these parties can't develop in that same way. So, for example, I mean, one may not like the cult of Bhutto or the fact that Nawaz Sharif has a hold over his party or any of these things. But the reality is that if you actually interrupt the process, you give these people a new lease on life and they actually... So their you're position both, making, they're both, both making the argument that the, the crucial thing is to have transfers of power from one civilian government to the next. Uh, absolutely. And if I may, uh, Owen, very, very, very briefly, yep. Uh, yep. in terms of what this particular, not this government, but this parliament has done, uh, in terms of what it can do, which is legislate, is an exemplary job. They have actually passed three constitutional amendments. They've got a mechanism down mm. for the transfer of power. They've devolved power to the provinces. And really, their legislative record including their women's rights legislation, has been extraordinary. And, and no one expected that. And no one, no one expected, expected that, yeah. with coalition governments okay. at all. Fasana, can, can you, uh, I saw you scribbling notes, I, so I'll just ask you, well, to, to, I, I, what are your notes? I was actually going to come in with, um, with the point about uh, this government's um, uh, quite significant constitutional amendments. Um, the 18th Amendment, which was passed by this government, uh, was uh, e an extraordinary move. Uh, basically, what it did was to restore uh, the supremacy of parliament. Uh, the president ceded his powers under the constitution uh, to, to the prime minister. Uh, we've had recently um, the uh, passage of the 20th uh, Amendment, which puts into place um, a caretaker government to supervise um, free and fair elections. Now, these are quite extraordinary measures, I think, particularly when you think of uh, elected governments more often than not uh, in Pakistan, uh, imperfect though they may be, besieged uh, by, by uh, 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 an ever ambitious uh, military. Uh, I think. It is fair to say, of course, uh, that this government could have done more. It has been perhaps altogether too preoccupied with political survival uh, over uh, passing uh, legislation, over introducing desperately needed economic reforms. Uh, 
Uh, but when you actually consider that uh, it, has, it has achieved what it has uh, in uh, circumstances uh, that have been extremely difficult, not just uh, at the domestic, uh, on the domestic front, but also regionally. I mean, you know, Pakistan is a country at war. Uh, so, you know, I think it's important to see uh, these achievements, modest though they may appear, uh, in, in, in sort of uh, in, in the context of, uh, of a country that is also uh, uh, at war, uh, uh, a country that is mired in conflict. And it is also probably worth saying that this, this government may well, if it may not get right to the end of its term, but it's going to do incredibly well given the Pakistan precedence of getting very close. Well, you already to, have, I mean, Yusuf Raza Gilani is the longest serving prime minister yeah. in Pakistan. So, uh, Anatol, yeah. Uh, yes, and, and, and then after this, we'll throw it open to questions. So, yeah. I mean, one, one thing, one reason why it probably will, well, I hope it, I hope very much it will survive to the end of its term. I should say, I hope very much also, I, I endorse what my colleagues say uh, about it not being brought down by very legally questionable moves by the um, uh, the Supreme Court. Uh, one reason, however, why it looks as if it'll get to the end of its term. Uh, is that unlike in the past, the main opposition parties are not trying to overthrow it at the moment by extra parliamentary, extra democratic means. They have learnt something, it seems. Navarre has learnt something from the 1990s. Of course, in the 90s, both the PMLN when it was in opposition and the PPP when it was in opposition constantly intrigued with the military to bring the military into politics to get rid of the government in power. So. You know, when it comes to military involvement in politics in the past, it was by no means only the military which you know, bore a share of the responsibility for that. Achievements of the present government. Yes, um, the 18th Amendment, a great achievement, especially when it came to balancing powers between the pro uh, rebalancing powers and revenues within the, between the provinces. Uh, building on the Finance Commission Award of 2010. Um, Really serious achievements. The, you know, this is explosive stuff in many federations around the world, balancing revenues and powers, especially rebalancing them between different provinces. The problem is that, as far as I can see to date, it hasn't led to actual improvements in governance, you know, in, in the actual quality of the government. It's improved relations between the provinces. If it had been done 10 years ago, which of course it wouldn't have been under Musharraf, uh, it might have done something to, to head off um, the latest rebellion in Baluchistan, would, which would have been a good thing. But no, there are real achievements here. On the other hand, um, the military puts the, well, three things. First, um, human rights abuses in Pakistan. Uh, I probably needn't tell you that probably the most numerous still, even in the context of counterinsurgency against the Pakistani Taliban and in Baluchistan, you know, if you follow this on a day-to-day -day basis, the greatest, as well as some of the most dreadful human rights abuses in Pakistan are, of course, directed against women. Uh, or um, not just against women, but also in cases involving family honor. These take place not just in the cities of Pakistan, but also in what might be called Pakistani cities in this country. Does the Pakistani military rule Bradford? or Manchester. No. This is nothing to do with the military. This is not, in fact, anything to do with the state as such. These are crimes committed by, if you like, patriarchal forces um, obeying communal law in their own communities. Often, it must be said, uh, in league with the police and the local courts, which won't prosecute them, as in a number of dreadful, particularly notorious cases that we know, uh, where the perpetrators were protected by local politicians, it must be said from all parties, not just from the PPP. Uh, the thing is, you see, we are, and even when the police commit crimes, this is, by the way, true in India as well. The Indian police, uh, you know, in a democracy, but I'm sure many of you have studied the record of the Indian police in many areas when it comes to the treatment of ordinary people, especially women, once again. Uh, there's not much in it, frankly, between the Indian and the Pakistani police in many areas of India. Um, because you know, this isn't poor old Manmohan Singh ordering them to torture and rape. This is what they do. This is the culture that they've inherited. Uh, therefore, to a degree, I mean, of course, Human Rights Watch uh, does excellent work. But to a degree, sometimes it also misses the point about the source 
of human rights abuses and why they happen. You can accuse the state of doing, not doing more to control these things, but the state as such is not responsible for them very often. It's a, it, this is all a result of state weakness rather than state strength, including an inability to control your own police forces. Uh, revenue and economic reform. Let's go back a year to the, um, uh, uh, the attempt to, to increase revenue by the government last March. Uh, failed. Why? Because of the military? No. Uh, because the parliament, dominated, as we all know, by people from a certain class, above all from the countryside, but not exclusively, refused point blank to increase taxation when it came to the, in the taxation of them and their own interests. A mini-budget, therefore, was eventually passed by decree by the president. He couldn't, in, in other words, the president and the government could not get their own parliamentarians to, to attempt to increase revenue by taxing themselves. It uh, was passed by decree um, under pressure, I have it on non-military authority, I have to say, by a mixture, of course, as usual, of the international finance institutions and the military. The notion that the military <coughs> obstruct economic reform and other kinds of reform by governments in power is simply not the case. The, the military has no interest in this most of the time um, or is even supportive. Uh, for this, uh, you can, now you can certainly say that the military has disrupted uh, you know, the regular workings of democracy, certainly, although it must be said on a couple of occasions at least, um, civilian rulers have also sought to do that in the past. But I would say, you see, oh, and by the way, just to repeat, I say, let me say again, the military is efficient in its own sphere, and to some extent, things sort of traditionally associated with that, like disaster relief, though only to an extent. Why? Because it has so much more money than any other bit of the state system. Absolutely. By the same token, when it takes over the state as a whole, at least since Ayub Khan, it's no better than anybody else. Same things. But just to conclude, <coughs> If you take some other examples around the world, in Latin America in the past, in the Philippines, alas, over the years, when, when did the last military government fall in the Philippines? 80 something? Cory <laughs> Keener. Can't remember. You have alternations in power of different political parties and different sort of populist figures. Does this, trans does, does this actually transform the Philippines? Does this lead to increased improvements in governance? Does this lead to improvements in, eco you know, in economic reform? No, <coughs> not because the, the Filipino military, as far as I know, plays any role whatsoever in blocking these, but because you have the rule in the Philippines of a certain kind of political class <coughs> with a very, very strong interest in maintaining the existing system, and which is either unwilling or incapable of changing this system in ways that will actually develop the country. Uh, this is not the role of the, Pakistan, of the <coughs> Filipino military, it's a rule of the political system and the nature of thank the economy and society. Thank you very much. I want to throw it open because we've got a, uh, we, we started slightly late, so we've done just about right timing. So now is to come to you and to ask questions. And there's a question here. If you could wait for the microphone and tell us who you are, that would be uh, great. My name's Ralph Blumenau. Um, you've talked about three power centers, the army, the uh, civilian government, um, and the courts, but the elephant in the room has not been mentioned at all, which is the religious people. And uh, the Americans, some say. Yeah, the Americans. Well, yes, yeah, but I mean, internally in Pakistan, it would be interesting to have your views about that. On the, on the strength of the religious parties? Well, that nobody dares, for instance, over the blasphemy laws. I mean, nobody mm. dares to stand up for what they, I think, probably believe in that, that the blasphemy laws are wrong, but if they don't say so, journalists get killed. Well, I don't have to spell it yeah. all. I mean, Ali Dayan, I must say, has, has done precisely yeah. that, so I think I should let you talk on that. Um, in terms of religious parties and militancy, religious militant groups, this is a fault line that runs across Pakistan. So it's not specific to, uh, it's not geographically specific or, 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 or anything of the sort. As a consequence, actually, um, and of course, all religious militant groups in Pakistan began life as proxies of the military and were used by them as instruments of national security policy. And the greatest detrimental impact of that was on Pakistani society and the rights of Pakistani people themselves. Now, if you have a security-centered uh, 
Washington DC perspective on this, this would not matter to you. Uh, what matters to you is Al Qaeda and the Taliban and, 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 and that sort of thing. But if you are looking at from Pakistan from within, uh, the incursion into your social space matters tremendously to you. And this is something that, that bothers Pakistanis. In terms of the blasphemy law, uh, I've worked extensively on that. And that's a slightly different thing. It's a more complicated issue. Um, it's an issue where you have a combine of not just the Deobandis, who are Taliban and Al-Qaeda supporters, but also the Bireilvis, uh, uh, which are the other Sunni sects, uh, principal sects. Um, it is an issue on which religious parties use the Friday sermons to mobilize uh, public opinion. And there are certainly blind spots in, in Pakistani society. And I have certainly found that the blasphemy law, the treatment of minorities in general, is one of those blind spots. I would also clarify that this was not the case. This was not the case in Pakistan. Uh, it was These were laws that were put in place in 1979 by General Ziaul Haq, who, by putting those laws in place, made the state a partisan sectarian actor and gave religious parties disproportionate uh, control over the public discourse, which is what they seek to preserve by defending these laws, laws such as the blasphemy law. It is that if you remove these laws, the state becomes a neutral arbiter between citizens. And that's exactly what they're trying to prevent. They want the state to have a religious leaning. And, and, and so uh, the debate over the laws becomes very, very contentious and, and uh, uh, different. Uh, now, in terms of, of, of how you view these figures, military figures, uh, like General Zaul Haq, who imposed Islam um, on, on Pakistan. Nobody was asking for it. It was his idea. He had the vision thing. Uh, I'm sorry, General Zia imposed Islam uh, Islamic on laws, Islamic okay, laws. I'm talking about Islamic laws. Bit. He imposed those his Islamic laws, um, which led to uh, widespread social persecution, public floggings, uh, uh, the criminalization of women uh, simply uh, for, for being in all sorts of compromising situations. And, um, and of course, none of this mattered to the Western policy maker and those feeding uh, Western policy making because it was not their concern. Uh, Professor Levin did write a very famous obituary of General Ziaul Haq in which he described this man as someone not described as vindictive even by his enemies, whereas Personally. he was the most uh, vindictive per ruler Pakistan has ever known. Personally vindictive. What what exactly is the distinction between personal <laughs> and, and, and large scale social? I mean, personal Pol Pot revenge. was not personally vindictive. What does that no, mean? But if, if you hang okay, if okay. you hang uh, a prime minister, I mean that's pretty personal. That's pretty personal, isn't it's it? It's pretty personal. Extensive support. Can I just answer that? If, 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 you, if you cast hold his hold daughter hold into hold 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 stuff, hold hold that's pretty there's personal. There's been a hold hold serious hold error of history here. Oh, if you remember, if you remember, <coughs> the person who declared Pakistan an Islamic Republic and institutionalized various forms of in, uh, Islamic law first in Pakistan. Of course, he didn't carry it very far. Was who? Yes, it was Zulfikar Ali Bhutto. No, no, but hold on a second. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Why? <laughs> because the religious parties already had a measure of power, and he wanted to neutralize that and buy them off, un quite unsuccessfully, by the way. In, in now, the what, last couple of weeks on, of his yeah, government. What I was the nature of that power? Now, this is very interesting. Not, of course, as we all know, because except for briefly in certain places, they have massive electoral support. They, you know, th they've never won anything remotely resembling a majority, in part because, once again, their specific theology is limited to part of the population. What they have always been able to do is two things street power, muscle. They've been able to, to mobilize thugs you know, on the street to cause trouble. Going back, by the way, once again, not to Zia, but all the way back to the anti-Ahmadi riots you know, of the early 1950s. That they've always had, and they've been able yeah. to, alas, <coughs> mobilize or move large numbers of people briefly with the cry of Islam in danger in one way or another. People who wouldn't vote for them but who in certain circumstances are prepared to demonstrate for them or sympathize with them. Uh, now, of course, once again, I mean, this is something which goes back um, far beyond the, well, the beginnings of the Pakistani state itself, if you look at the origins of these movements and their capacity at various times. 
going back, for example, to the Khilafat movement in the 1920s to mobilize large numbers of people okay. under this slogan of Islam. Let, let, me, let, me, let me stop that there. And I'm going to let Omar just have a quick, obviously a person to say something, have a quick word, and then I want to throw it open to the audience and bring in Fazan. No, 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 since we were in the business of uh, clearing the historical record, uh, the reason why Bhutso introduced the name is the Islamic Republic of Pakistan was a symbolic political reference is because he didn't want to be part of, uh, he wanted to be a, a pro-American satellite and he wasn't welcome in the non-aligned movement. He wanted to actually create, develop better relations with the rest of the Muslim world. Uh, so you have the OIC conference in Lahore in 1974 and this is why as far as the laws go that was a desperate last ditch effort that happened last few weeks of his uh, government. It wasn't a policy he introduced of his own volition. This is a response to, you know, uh, to determine street power and the backing of the establishment. Okay, I do want to bring more people in. So there's one here, and I will. Uh, I'll tell you what, we've, we'll take a few in a group in a moment. But let's just have one. Yes, I'm uh, uh, Bashar Nazir. I'm actually belonging to the Amdiya Muslim Community. Professor Levin, thank you very much for mentioning us. In addition to women, as you mentioned, uh, minorities have also been uh, greatly suffering in Pakistan. And uh, thank you very much for the discussion so far. I'm from Pakistan and still have learned a lot from what you have, uh, the points you have raised. The point I want to make is that most of the discussion so far has, has been around the leadership or military and so on. And what about the 180 million uh, people? You know, what is happening there? Uh, do, we, do we really realize, I mean, they are in extreme deprivation. A strange kind of people, really. They have got extreme resilience. They keep on really mm -hmm. uh, adjusting to whatever you throw at them. Uh, but also we are having this extreme barbism uh, coming up. They are barbaric, turning into barbaric people. Uh, there is intolerance and there is disregard of law. doesn't matter what the law says. It's the jungle law which really prevails in that. And in respect of how the Muslim community, <coughs> we, today, just today, we have had one person in Sindh killed. That's the second person in Sindh killed because of his faith. And okay. I can tell you about barbaric. And if you just say, Today, somebody's tongue was cut from the root of his mouth because of a, a family dispute. You know, what is happening to, to our people? Why it is an Islamic Republic of Pakistan? We should have been an exemplary country to the, to the, to the world. But, I mean, we are despicable people. What has happened and what's the way out of that? OK, let, let me just bring in Fasana and ask you about this gap between because it, I mean, it is true that in these discussions, we often end up talking about the Supreme Court, the, 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 the civilian government, the army leadership. Yeah, and there are tens of millions of people who are, in many cases, really desperate situation. Uh, and, you know, I, I did a story recently on the number of people committing suicide because they couldn't cope with feeding their families. And it is absolutely incredible. I went to Lahore and asked the crime reporters there for if they could steer me in the direction of such a family. And by the, that was about 9 o'clock at night. But by the 9 o'clock in the morning, I had about 10 cases in the mm. last few days the where, 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 where farmers had uh, basically been so ashamed that they couldn't cope with their providing for their children and their wives that they committed suicide. I mean, it is an absolutely desperate situation. So can you, can you sort of talk to us about the, 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 this, this extraordinary disjunct there is between the, 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 the elite and, and, and the people? Well, I mean... There is a disjunction, disjuncture here, uh, no doubt about that. I just perhaps uh, will take that question uh, at two levels. One is uh, this, this, this issue of, of resilience. And it's, it's, uh, it's a word that's very often used uh, in relation to, to, to Pakistan. And uh, to my mind, I'm actually troubled by the use of the word resilience because what it seems to me uh, would be a more appropriate choice of word uh, is resignation. Uh, it's not resilience, it's resignation. Uh, the, 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 the widespread perception, rightly or wrongly, that there are no options left and so one must simply press on. Is that resilience or is that resignation? Uh, and of course, uh, you know, attached to this is, is the idea that um, you know, because the ordinary uh, person in Pakistan is resilient, uh, you know, he or she can take anything, that mm. nothing will break 
Pakistan. And mm -hmm. that, in a way, to my mind, is troubling because, in a sense, it gives license to violence. You inflict violence at, uh, of all sorts, at yes. every level, uh, and, and, and with impunity, on the assumption that people are resilient. Now, I really think that while it's it's, 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 it's good to recognize resilience <coughs> as a noble attribute that one attaches to the people of Pakistan generally. Um, it, it, it also carries with it uh, suggestions that, as I said, are, 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 are more troubling. As far as the second point is concerned, which is to say uh, the, 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 the position and status of minorities, um, and I have a great deal uh, about this issue uh, in my book, I would almost be minded to say that what Pakistan really needs is not an election. It needs a new constitutional settlement. We need to reopen the whole issue of citizenship uh, in Pakistan and make citizenship no longer conditional upon one's putative relationship to Islam. I mean, the whole idea of citizenship under the constitution in Pakistan today is so sullied, so distorted, precisely under the pressure of, 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 of a certain kind of pernicious religious discourse that, as I said, I am sometimes almost tempted to say that what Pakistan needs are not fresh elections, <coughs> but a new constitution. OK, thank you. What I'm going to do is take three or four questions at once, because there are so many people who want to ask things. Let's just start with this, this side of the room. Uh, if you could do that one over there first, she's had a hand up. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, my name is Jennifer Harbison. I just wanted to follow up on this question of sort of emerging power centers. And we've, we've talked, uh, you know, obviously about the sort of the big three, and then there was some mention about parliament um, actually getting busy and, 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 and doing things. And, and one thing, that sort of two more that I'd like the, the panel's comments on. One is, um, and we mentioned it briefly, is, is Imran Khan and the, and the PTI, um, getting a lot of press, certainly here in the UK, a couple of, couple of profile pieces that seem to suggest that he's the next great thing. Um, and then um, also there was mentioned the US. Um, to what extent is the US a player, a power center in Pakistan? OK, and we, there's one down here in the corner. Yeah, yeah I'd add to that to say we, we need to talk about the media. And, and just to address the question of what somebody called resilience, um, uh, uh, something that has really troubled me uh, a lot <coughs> is that why in Pakistan, when hundreds of people get killed by bombs or Taliban activities, people just say it's the will of God. And they, they are very quick to <coughs> condemn drone strikes and army ab and ab abuses by the military or abuses by the police and they get really worked up and angry about it but when hundreds and hundreds of people are killed by bombs and Taliban attacks and, uh, and, and shootings and um, uh, being uh, wrapped up in gunny bags and thrust into the gutters uh, what is human what rights what you're doing about that why aren't people angry about that yeah. can you pass the microphone there? Professor Lee mentioned uh, the Philippines and India. Very interesting. I spent my last 15 years working in the UN. And one of the questions which we used to ask, or other people asked, what is the problem with South Asia? Because India today, even in 2011, compared to Southeast Asia, remains a poor country. Thank you very much. And uh, there's one here. <coughs> Uh, my question is to Professor Levin. Um, do you know in Pakistan there have been so much news, not always of the good variety that's been emerging in the last years that we forget some of the scandals of the past. And my question relates to one of those. Um, so um, I wanted to basically ask you is about, do you think the uh, Pakistani army has ed had, had any role to play in selling nuclear weapons to other countries like Iran and Libya and North Korea? I don't know if you've read the book Deception. Um, which has been written by Washington Post journalists. And following from that question is that, do you think the Pakistani army had a role, if any, to play in, um, in giving refuge to Osama bin Laden, who was staying in an army town in Aptabad with very high walls, and a lot of people have, you know, sort of 
Okay. Thanks very much. So let's just deal with those. I'm going to ask um, Omar, can you tell us about Imran Khan mm. and uh, what his prospects are? Well, Imran Khan's been in the, world, in the political wilderness since he set up his party in 1996. He did gather some popularity um, around the time of the movement, uh, the lawyers' movement and the movement against Musharraf. He's, for example, very prominently involved with uh, speaking out against the MQM, taking to the streets, supporting the lawyers' movement. He was jailed briefly, but he boycotted the 2008 election, so we weren't able to properly evaluate what his level of popularity is. It's related to the question of the media. I mean, what Imran himself concedes is that the reason why he's acquired a certain relevance is because of the cable media penetration, especially in urban Punjab. So you go right down the GT road or even, you know, uh, it's expanding s slightly further south of that and especially in the frontier. In the frontier, he is wildly popular, partly because of his anti-US position, for the fact that people are war-weary and would not like to see any further military operations. And in Punjab, in particular urban Punjab, where there is a different kind of political discourse. If you travel into rural parts of the country or you travel particularly into the provinces, uh, politics is viewed very differently. In urban Punjab, there is a great deal of obsession um, with the, these day-to-day -day issues in terms of uh, uh, corruption, for example, takes a far higher priority uh, amongst people's concerns than other, other you know, fundamental issues may so on. So he is popular either within urban Punjab, certainly. He is wildly popular in the frontier. Uh, whether that can be cashed in remains to be seen. However, what we have seen is in these recent by-elections where a number of people who joined his party very prominent people, m the bulk of them from um, Musharraf's former party, when they evacuate, when they vacated their seats and there were by-elections there, it people re-elected, people elected actually the traditional parties. You see, for example, Yusuf Raza Gilani's son emerge in Multan with uh, a, a much higher majority than his predecessor, Shah Mahmood Qureshi, the former foreign minister. But that's because the PTI did, boycotted the by-elections. They did a boycott. Suicidal it. Move no, but you see, if they spot. boycott, but that's the point, Fazana, is that you see, despite the call for boycotts, the voters don't stay at home and they go, oh, we'll wait for Imran to turn up next time round. So I, I, I do see him making inroads uh, in urban Punjab. Whether he can surpass the PMLN remains to be seen, which is the great force in urban Punjab. Uh, the PMLN has very deep roots, for example, amongst the trader class. It has deep roots amongst sections of, uh, of uh, uh, the Kashmiri community, the religious rights, and so on. So I see him perhaps uh, picking up a lot of votes in the frontier so and making a, inroads. Beca becoming a force. Becoming a force. So, for example, what you might see him do is, perhaps at the very least, uh, take the sort of number of seats that the Q did the last time, so which is about 40 to 50 seats and you become the third largest party in Becoming parliament. a force but not prime minister. Yeah, I mean, the thing about Imran Khan is, you know, it's a good story. His is a good story. Great cricket player, handsome once married to a beautiful woman. Great story, but is it great politics? Um, and I fear, really, the jury is still out on that. Uh, and, and the key question is whether or not uh, you can transform uh, a fan club into a political constituency. I mean, he that's has the had bottom some line. massive rallies. Uh, he's had some massive rallies, but what's interesting about his constituency, and really the, the, the next elections will, in, in a sense, test this constituency because it is a it it has generally his supporters and generally this constituency has been hostile to politics. It's an apolitical and mm. anti-political constituency, and and the question is, are they going to come out? in sufficient numbers to return his power with uh, to return his party with w with a presence uh, in the legislature and i think it's simply too early to tell i have my doubts but what i do suspect is that as uh, anatol <coughs> was mentioning earlier on um, the more players there are uh, out there to balance the forces uh, the happier the military, and I think uh, one reason for um, uh, people suspecting uh, that Imran, uh, you know, is very much the military's toy boy, is he plays hard 
on the military's narrative, which is the anti-corruption narrative. This is a military narrative. I mean, Imran has singled out corruption as Pakistan's key problem. Many would say that it's actually violent militancy Mm. That that is Pakistan's key but, but problem. For, for Zana, it's also it's also an urban narrative as well. For of example, course. it's also the narrative adopted by Nawaz Sharif at all sure. of his rallies. Sure. I mean, this is one that is so shared independently oh. yeah. of the view of the military. I mean, but, there is a convergence with him on the military on certain questions. But I think, for example, in terms of you know his position on Balochistan, or on India, uh, or on. Um, uh, the idea of a welfare state. The, I mean, this will cause some tension with the military. Ultimately. Okay, quick word from Amsal. I'm going to get you on. T uh, the anti-corruption message resonates with a great many ordinary Pakistanis for reasons that should be obvious to everybody in this room. If there were direct presidential elections in Pakistan, then to judge by my research, is at least it must be said, yes, in the cities of uh, Punjab and uh, over Pakhtunkhwa, uh, Imran would stand a very good chance of winning outright. Mm. The point is a different one, which is hardly an original point, which is that it isn't. It's a parliamentary system, and you have to have an organization support local bosses in the constituencies. That he's never had. <laughs> to get that, the fear is, and I think it's a very rational fear, he will have to do so many deals or incorporate so many people who have always run on the basis of corruption and patronage, that that will neutralize uh, his ability actually to change the system. But his actual message, as far as Pashtuns and at least northern Punjab and urban northern Punjabis are concerned, has been very popular. Of course, the other thing is, when he says this, he's in a much stronger posi position than Nawaz Sharif, because he is not and has never been an incumbent. He's an outsider. Whereas, of course, the other reason he's doing so well is that both the other parties are you know, have records, shall we say, which he doesn't. But I'm sure he will acquire one, given time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, let me ask you about, because um, this is something that comes up not just in Pakistan, but in, 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 in many conflicts, is, is this issue of, you know, the government, human rights groups tend to hold governments to account for their human rights abuses, and, and less so insurgent movements, rebel movements, and so on. Well, actually, you know, the, the reason for why it plays out like that is very simple and straightforward. S states are, um, need to adhere to international law. They are signatories. They are party to the, the, the body of international law that, that governs behavior in conflict situations. Now, if they, or otherwise, now, if they fail to do that, we seek to hold them accountable, and there is a greater onus on them to do that. In terms of uh, militant groups, the Taliban in particular, we have said repeatedly that they have committed series of atrocities that amount to crimes against humanity. Why they have. Which, which actually brings us to your question about the media. Now, the media in Pakistan actually is, is a very interesting, I mean, I'm fond of saying that there are 26 news channels in Pakistan and 24 of them are Fox News. Uh, <laughs> you've got that, that situation. You've got a media that, unless it is given space by specific events, such as Memogate, where the intervention of Hussein Haqqani's lawyer, who basically uh, 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 was very, very uh, um, dismissive of the judiciary uh, at some personal risk, allowed the media to uh, criticize the judiciary and actually call it out as a political player and to argue that, the, the, that it was acting in concert with the army. Uh, otherwise, the, the, the media tends to, to on national, matters of national security, follow the military's line. Uh, it doesn't ever hold the military to account for abuses, and it follows an apologist line when it comes to the Taliban. So they will say, oh, terrorism is occurring, terrorism is bad, which then leads you to the, to the question, what is the connection between the terrorism and your state? When you can't address that question, you have a bogus discourse around, around that issue. Are you saying the military actually tells the anchors that they cannot... The, mi the military, the the military I, I, can tell, I can tell you that, that there was recently, there's been a lot of conversation about Balochistan and, uh, uh, and human rights abuses in Balochistan. And PEMRA, which is the Pakistan Electronic Media Regulatory Authority, has sent written instructions to the television channels they not that they will keep this. off this issue. So that's how it works. There is the, the idea that some, there is, of course, which doesn't mean that there is 
total censorship of the media. This is all in flux and in transition, and 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 it is changing. I mean, you, you, there you is did, one. You thing. did see it the other way for a moment, which was in the build-up to the SWAT campaign. Yeah. Then did. the military yeah. actually the all switched the, the media because the, the, the army wanted public support. They said we won't go in until we establish we have that public support, and so you see the entire media fall in line. But they also. Okay. Also, it, that was the start of it. But the other thing about uh, this, uh, the idea about uh, holding terrorism to account is one popular argument in the media. Now, I mean, I mean we, we can debate whether it's right or wrong, but the fact it's perceived as such is when the television anchor turns around and his guests say, well, it's because of America we have this war and therefore this is why it's happening. Absolutely. That scene is the principal cause and not the terrorists. Itself. And it is extraordinary. I mean, it can go to the most gross bomb site. Mm. I feel we, yeah. yeah, you've done this, I've done this, yeah. and, 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 and there's a Taliban bomb, it's quite obvious who planted it, and everyone around will blame America. Yeah, and the, the, there's the, a refusal the, to actually sort of... The, the media's default, so and also the, the default with Imran Khan, um, and to a lesser extent with Nawaz Sharif, is that their, their rhetoric is Taliban apologist rhetoric. So when you have that kind of political culture, strong, you have... Uh, the, Imran Khan's rhetoric is very Taliban apologist mm -hmm. rhetoric. He's actually mm -hmm. quite categorical no, about it. Okay, uh, okay. I, want to, I want to move this on because uh, I want to get another round of questions okay, in. Okay, and and you... I know, I know, I know. Uh, so so <laughs> can, can you do sort of one minute on nuclear proliferation and bin Laden? Well, well first... The, the roots of poverty and you know, governmental dysfunction in South Asia, uh, that's a big subject, but I suppose a very simple way of answering might be us, like the British. Um, I, 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 I'm exaggerating, but uh, clearly British rule did not contribute, uh, shall we say, helpfully to the development of that region. Anyway, nuclear issue. Uh, my problem with the book, the book Deception is, is not so much in its details, but in its overall tone. Uh, one does have to remember, of course, that India t was the country that actually first exploded a device twice. Mm. Now, my understanding is that starting, of course, once again with Bhutto in the 70s, a decision was made, and it, this isn't a secret, it's well known, to get a nuclear capacity at all costs, at all costs. And this was backed by civilian as well as military governments, but of course the military conducted it. And A.Q. Khan principally, but among others, was told, yeah, I mean, get us this capacity at all costs. Don't necessarily tell, you, tell us exactly what you're doing to get it, but get it. Do the necessary deals. And then, you know, of course, in the process, he also took a, a cut, you know, a commission for himself, which made him a very wealthy man. But I do not believe that he was acting as a wild free agent. That is a convenient... Mm myth that's been cooked up between America and Pakistan so that America doesn't have to actually go after the entire Pakistani security establishment and political system. And in the process, uh, yes, I mean, he did a lot of deals with countries, North, North Korea, with Libya and so forth. Uh, but uh, I, I believe that, you know, that was as part of an overall <coughs> Pakistani national strategy of getting the bomb. And it was not motivated, of course, by Islamist extremism. Uh, either on the part of the Pakistani security establishment as a whole, this was a, intended as a <coughs> Pakistani bomb deterrent, uh, nor, of course, was um, A.Q. Khan himself in any way an Islamist. He's a Pakistani nationalist. Uh, so, um, yeah, but I mean, of course... And, and quickly on bin Laden? Oh, heavens, another, I mean, another conspiracy, you know, conspiracy theory that will probably never be um, explained. Uh, it certainly does seem implausible on balance that somebody didn't know. Uh, but whether this was a sort of rogue group within the ISI, uh, which is really frightening if, because in that case it might have been because of actual ideological sympathy, or whether it was the high command um, basically trying to keep him on ice so as to do a deal with the Americans later, which is another suggestion. Or whether it was neither of these, and it was pure and simple incompetence, which, as I'm sure you're all aware, does happen in Pakistan from yeah. time to time, yeah. as everywhere else. I don't know. I don't okay, know. Let's, let's get another round of questions in, because uh, and then we'll have to close this. So there's one there. So from yeah, the um, my name is Masood Kazi. I've got a couple of questions. Um, first of all, is related to Memogate, and apparently that's for Dr. Fazana, since she mostly dictated that. Um, she said that. I mean, um, this guy, Mansoor Ijaz, has been I uh, pro ISI and then the CIA, CIA player as well. Uh, I think she didn't mention the stance he has against ISI as well, because last year in June 2001, he wrote a really full-fledged article in which he mentioned that there was a certain S-wing of ISI, yeah. which was basically the sponsor 
of main terrorism. And he categoric categorically said that ISI has been the uh, da real danger in Pakistan as goes extremism and this and that. So, I mean, my question is how we are really seeing him as a player out here in this regard. If he's is if he's bordering on to every other every other CIA or ISI or anti-ISI, so how exactly are we seeing him as? Okay, uh, thank second you. Question. I okay. mean, just I'll Correct be really quick. Okay, a uh, second one is more mostly regarding the I mean the stance we have regarding military interfering, and we have these coup, coup rumors. And as and uh, Professor Lemon said that I mean after four years, four and a half years, we are not supposed to be having a coup right now. I mean if we are supposed to be having it, we should have had it in the four years. This government has been so incompetent in an overall sense that if we talk about economic reforms, I don't think that that's something to do with military. If you talk about law and order, if you talk about Chief Minister Sindh Zulfikar Mirza, he runs a mafia literally. He runs this people's uh, Aman committee. He has his extortion issues. People are afraid of doing business out there in Karachi. I'm from. I've got my relatives out there, so I know my relatives. They've literally flee uh, flee the country because people come out there. They ask for 25 lakhs rupees. They don't have it. Why? They're coming from Pima People's Zaman Committee, or they're coming from MQM, which is another side of the mafia. So this has nothing to do with military, I think, because it's more with the government, the government in incompetence we have, even on provincial level or federal level. So how how are we seeing this government? Thank you. There was one. Yeah, this there. Uh, <clears throat> I just wanted to ask about the U.S. because we've asked a few times, but we haven't actually <laughs> gotten right, to yeah, it. Yeah. Uh, if, if the panel could discuss whether they think the U.S. has had a pernicious role in Pakistan in the last 10 years, uh, and, and if you guys could uh, connect that to Afghanistan. And in the last six months, do you think the U.S. has been more patient uh, with Pakistan than before? Has it helped? Uh, and, and is the U.S. and Pakistan now finally coming uh, into unity in terms of how to end the war in Afghanistan? Thanks. There are two questions there, uh, just on the second row in. Yep, just there, that's right. Hi, just want to make uh, two points initially. Um, I'm Indian, so I take offense to saying that Rahul Gandhi is going to be the next prime minister. I don't think so. A lot of people don't think so. Um, we'll but see. Um, we <laughs> shall indeed. Um, uh, the, the main point is what, I mean, normal people, I'm not talking about the elite or I'm not talking about the, the wealthy middle classes. I'm talking about normal people on the ground. Are they affected by anything that happens in India? Do they find out? Uh, and, and does India have a role to play in hopefully Pakistan not imploding because that will affect us the most? And just next to you to someone. Oh, you're helping us? <laughs> <That's> very <laughs> very <laughs> good. Well, you did a good job. <laughs> uh, well. Can you do the one behind? It's been asking a long time. So yeah, yeah. Yes, um, thank, thank you very much. My, my question is um, based on the um, BBC correspondence panel that Mr. Bennett Jones chaired at the turn of the year where the comment was made in relation to Syria but it could apply to other Arab Spring countries and I'm just wondering if we're seeing any changes in Pakistan this was look for where the elites are hedging their bets by sending their adult or semi-adult children to safety in other countries and getting their wealth out are we seeing any of the uh, traditional elites doing more of this or changing what they're doing and people who haven't done it and are we seeing the military starting to appear commercially as opposed to just military mm -hmm. in other countries where they haven't perhaps been before in other words are people at the top hedging their bets against the state implosion to a greater extent than they have thank you very much and we'll do two more uh there's one here and one there Maybe the panel can help me understand something. If Pakistan government doesn't have a, um, if it doesn't have any issues with the idea of Kashmir having self determined, being self determined, um, why is that such an issue with Balochistan? Um, why can't it be independent? Baluchi self determination. And just what on that? Uh, hi, my name's Safiye. Um, I had a, I had a comment and a bit of a question. Uh, as a woman, as a Pakistani woman. I find it a bit, um, <laughs> I don't appreciate the fact that we're more reduced to a point in a debate. So instead of talking about the women, wouldn't it be better to talk to the women? Uh, yeah, the, that's my main thing. It's just a question and a comment, generally. Yeah? Thank, Thank you very you. much. Now then, unfortunately, normally the, the idea of doing that is that people ask the same question twice, and then, and then <laughs> you can save time. <laughs> but that didn't work at all. <laughs> so uh, so I, I'm just going to ask people to be quite brief. I think that's all we can do, really, because uh, we're, we're running slightly over. So, so let me, I mean, let's, let's deal with the US 
the U.S. role and whether that's changed. It's a big topic. It's come up a number of times. Fazana, you must be have something to say on, on, on w what's happened with that relationship. Be very yeah. briefly. I yeah. mean, it's, it, it's no secret. I mean, this, this, this relationship is, uh, is, is uh, flawed and frayed. Um, America's role uh, in the region, of course, uh, has, uh, has been seen uh, to be extremely damaging. Uh, we have no shortage uh, of people in Pakistan now who uh, routinely castigate uh, America for all the ills uh, that have beset uh, Pakistan. Uh, I think the truth probably lies uh, elsewhere. I think many of Pakistan's ills are self-inflicted. Uh, I am also on record as having said that one way in which we can actually uh, reduce uh, America's presence in the region, and of course particularly in Pakistan, is if Pakistan and its governments seriously normalize relations with India. The reason why we have be grown to become so dependent, and by we I mean mainly Pakistan's military, grown to become so dependent on the United States is because we have always looked to the United States to protect us against uh, the enemy, which is perceived to be India. So one way in which we can reduce that dependence on America, reduce its presence in, 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 in the region, is by normalizing relations um, with, with India. OK, let me, let me ask you, Ali, about this. Um, is, you know, if, if, if Kashmiri self-determination is such a good thing, uh, is Baluch self-determination the same thing? Well, I mean, I can... I can tell you that Human Rights Watch takes no position on the issue of self-determination. <laughs> but that's not the point. The point is that actually these two situations aren't comparable because Kashmir has been a disputed territory under international law since 1948. Balochistan is not a disputed territory. It is an internationally recognized part of Pakistan. And certainly, it is my view, and it is our organizational view that the constitutional protections available in Pakistan to all citizens should also be available in Balochistan. Yes, and yes. that's what the problem is, that they're not. Um, uh, so uh, uh, there is, I don't think that you can actually compare these situations, just as you can't use patriarchy as an excuse for military abuses. That also doesn't work. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, now, hang on a second. You have to elaborate on that one. It's, it, it, I, it was, I did not say was, anything remotely resembling that. Correct well, yourself. That's what I heard. Uh, you were mistaken. No, I wasn't actually. And do not actually, put words into my Because that is what this you is said. Is that is what you said. <laughs> and that's, you know, no, it's... Okay, okay, hold, 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 hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. You should be ashamed of yourself. You should stop interrupting him. No, I was attacked directly. I will allow you to say Whatever you want, allow me as well. Okay. No, not if you're going to attack. Uh, <coughs> words into, into my mouth. Fini finish, no, your, I, 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 finish your comment. Okay. okay. We'll anyway, so so uh, oh, I'm sorry that you're upset. That wasn't my intention. But I'm patriarchy and abuses, military abuses, are apples and oranges. That's all I'm saying. Uh, but further, I, I, I would I, I'd like to add a very prosaic, unfashionable point about the U.S.-Pakistan relationship and the problem with it. And that is that it's a mutually abusive relationship. Mm -hmm. That's the problem. Mm -hmm. this, there is something that, that, that this whole business of all oh, the Pakistani people are so resilient. I agree that, that they may be resilient, but there is a point at which you say, enough already. And that's what happens. There is the whole business of aid is overblown. There is what percentage of GDP is uh, uh, US aid to Pakistan? That's a very important question. Who is it going to? Who are the beneficiaries of that aid? That's equally a very important question. And how are the beneficiaries, which in this case primarily largely has been the military, themselves view that aid is also an important question. So the Pakistan army will turn around and tell you quite reasonably from their perspective that when the US says, oh, we have given you $10 billion over eight years in coalition support funds, their position is that's payment for services rendered thank you very much. Mm. Do not expect any gratitude, and you've done us no favors. Mm. That's how they see it. 
Okay, thank you. Would you I'm going to let you, Anatol, respond to the point you objected to. So, you, we, we you, you, you what, about your point. It, it was stated that the overwhelming majority of human rights abuses in Pakistan are the work of the military. That is true in the context of military operations in Baluchistan and uh, Fata and Swat. Uh, it is not true when it comes to society as a whole. That is why I referred to actions by the police, act social actions by local communities or local dominant groups against women. First thing. Other points? To no, no, no. I was just wanted you to respond to that first, and I, uh, then I'll come back to you. And then uh, on this point of the elite, yeah. are they parking their money? I mean, in a way, that's happened for years, in a sense. No, I mean, well, it, it, I mean, it, it, it happened. When it happened was when Bhutto got elected. It happened in the 70s. That's when people started to leave. That's when people started to... There's a famous incident where Bhutto went to go and visit the industrialist Nassim Segal, and he said, so, Nassim, what are you doing? And he said, well, I'm building a house. He said, you don't have to build a house. You need to leave the country. And that's when... And so a lot of families took off. And so the idea of the elite parking their wealth, I mean, they've had their wealth outside for ages. We have, I mean, amongst uh, General Musharraf lives around the corner. You know, who's not going back anytime soon, and his children have been outside the country for a very long time. I think it's fair so to say, virtually every member of the elite, in, I mean, yeah. every party has property in central mm. London. Yeah, no, they all have rep <laughs> they all have representation at the Metropole. So it's a, it's, it's a tradition going back to Gandhi, Nehru, and Jinnah. So, fine, thank you for that. And uh, yes, Anthony, you wanted to. Uh, make you, US and, uh, well, just to endorse one thing, uh, U.S. aid as such not important to the Pakistani economy, but you're quite right. The institution it is very important to is the military, yeah. which at the same time, of course, constantly complains about the US. Uh, US role, I mean, uh, uh, I would say, I mean, uh, what has happened in, in the, the rise of militancy in Pakistan has come from a combination uh, of old roots of militancy in the society, mm -hmm. the actions of the Pakistani military from the 1980s on in building up these groups, but yes, I mean, the US presence in Afghanistan then as a catalyst, which has really angered large numbers of people in Pakistan, especially in the Pashtun areas, who were not formally uh, supportive of the militants. Uh, somebody asked about um, uh, peace in Afghanistan. Uh, ideally, um, uh, of course, Pakistan and America ought now to be coming gradually onto the same page. Uh, after many years in which Pakistan was advocating peace talks with the Taliban and America was saying no, uh, the Obama administration has now opened direct talks with the Taliban. The problem is, as far as I can see, that ideas of what those talks should lead to are still actually very different. Um, there are strong forces, at least at present, and I think up to the US elections in the administration in Washington, in the military, in the CIA, who basically want to use the talks to split the Taliban um, and turn them against each other in a way that will make an overall compromise impossible. The Pakistani foreign and security establishment believes that you basically have to have a settlement with the Taliban as a whole, mm -hmm. with its leadership, uh, leading to a new kind of political compromise. I have a feeling that it is possible that after the next US elections, uh, as you know, time really begins to run out for the US military presence in Afghanistan, and by the way for the Karzai administration, which of course, according to the Constitution, has to leave in 2014, that Obama might actually come over to the idea of the need for an overall settlement. Which is not to say, of course, that he can sell it in Kabul or anywhere else. But until that happens, uh, not just the military, but the foreign office in Islamabad and the government uh, is going to be very, very wary of becoming too supportive of an American agenda, which they're not at all sure of, but which they believe, if it fails, they could be made the scapegoats for. OK, I'm going to wrap it up there. And uh, I would just say, uh, as we look ahead, I mean, the, the big thing probably is whether this government can get through to this final term, which will be Mar Mar March, next March. March next year, or whether there will be elections in the autumn. And I mean, either way, it's quite a significant achievement to get that far. But if it does, I mean, it matters actually whether it gets to March. I mean, it is a fuller, proper full term, and whether it is actually in power, or whether there's a caretaker government installed by, by presumably the military to try, try, try and, uh, you know, maybe interfere with the process. So uh, that is one of the big questions uh, over the next uh, six months. But as we've heard, there are, there are, there are, there are, there are many others. Uh, there are, there's a lot going on. So thank you very much to the panel for uh, the very lively debate. <laughs>